Greetings and welcome back to our Confirmation Catechism Review. Uh, I decided to change it up today and, and sit with the, all the Confirmation pictures, the, uh, the classes I've done over the years in the background because I know the people watching this, the 8th graders, are getting ready, hopefully, for Confirmation uh, the first Sunday in May if we're allowed to be having church then. Um, but certainly at some point this spring or summer, uh, we hope to be having uh, your picture up here. And this is obviously the first time we've tried to do the big review um, via these videos. Uh, and so this is this is very different for all of us. And I want you to know that I'm going to be skipping around a little bit and coming back to important points. For instance, we haven't talked much about law and gospel, which is one of the main ways of understanding the scriptures. But I want to make sure we get through you know, basically the, the commandments and sections of the creed in the Lord's Prayer, and then we're going to have some uh, chance to talk about these bigger topics uh, as we go. Today, uh, we are going to be on page 58 of the Catechism, of, of your Catechism, talking about the First Commandment. And this is the first thing that, uh, these are the things that we want you to know by heart. So uh, if somebody says, what is the First Commandment? You should be able to say, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, you should know that by heart. And that I, I, it's, it's something that I can't stress enough that it, it's really important, even if you don't understand why now, and if you feel like you're the sort of person who's not good at memory work, or that, you know, it's just you keep it for 10 minutes and then it's gone. Don't worry about that right now. You're, you're just going to have to to trust that it makes a big difference in life if you, if you memorize uh, just those little explanations. Um, that's how the catechism was designed, and, and people have been doing it for 500 years uh, to good effect. So what does it mean to say, you shall have no other gods? Well, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what's a god? You know, on one hand, there is only the one god. We know that from the scriptures. We know that all through, from Genesis onward, there really is only one God, and then there's uh, gods that aren't gods or are fake, or they are uh, false gods. So um, how can we say, you know, what is a God? Well, a God is what you look to, uh, to receive all good things, to defend you. It's where you place your trust in anything that is higher than yourself. Now, for some people, they just make themselves their own God. Uh, and we're going to talk about why that doesn't make any sense. But it's very, very common for people to say, I just trust me. Uh, and there isn't anything higher than me. Um, well, we'll see why that doesn't make sense as we look at the real God. Uh, but a God is from whom you receive all good things, including yourself. This is why you can't have your your own God. You didn't create you. Uh, remember in, in class, if you remember, I always say, where were you uh, a year before you were born? Well, you didn't exist. Well, what did you do to come into existence? You just did. Um, so your God is your creator. Now, that, that may seem very, very obvious, uh, but a lot of things flow from that. Uh, first is, you are whatever God says you are. He's the artist, you're the work of art. Uh, uh, he created everything. Um, so, in an objective level, you aren't whatever you say you are, because you're the object. The, the one who's determining that is the creator of that. Um, and so, in addition to everything like your body, your soul, your family, your house, everything, you know, the world, you know, the stars, everything that God made, the thing that you receive only from God is your true identity. Who you really are is a gift that you receive uh, from God. Uh, like we said, you are whatever God says you are. So uh, when we talk about who's your God, we're talking about who gets to tell you who you are at the very, very basic level? From whom do you receive your identity? Uh, now, false gods, there's plenty of false gods out there. Um, 
that will demand that you fear, love, and trust in them. And they can make a per pretty persuasive case because, you know, whereas the true God goes by faith, the false gods get to go by sight. And the false gods will say things like, uh, you are good enough if. You're good enough if you get all A's, if you have a date to prom. You're good enough if you get into the right college or if you drive this kind of car. Um, they're always holding up some kind of hoop for you to jump through to prove that you're good enough. Um, the true God always says, in, in, when we get back to law and gospel, in the gospel, the true God says, you're good enough because. Now, according to the law, it's you're good enough if, and we all fail. But according to the gospel, it's you're good enough because of what I did for you. That's the voice of the true God um, in the gospel. So it says we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. To fear God uh, simply means to acknowledge his authority, to um, own up to the fact that he has the right to judge you and to punish you if you fail to keep the Ten Commandments. So it's, it's not fear in the sense of be terrified, or it's fear in the sense of the way you might fear the king or you might have a sense of trembling going to the principal's office or something because you recognize that person can mete out uh, rewards and punishments. Uh, so you acknowledge that God is your rightful judge, that you aren't, God is. You fear, um, and that's according to the law. But according to the gospel, you love God because you know that he is also your loving father, uh, that because he first loved you, he liberates you, he frees you up to love him in return. And then, therefore, you trust him because, again, he doesn't go by sight. He can't, he doesn't mete out the rewards and punishments like with bolts of lightning and so forth. You have to trust that his promises are true and then you rely on them so that when the whole world is making fun of you, but you know you're a child of God, you're, so who do you trust? The voice of the whole world or the voice of God? Uh, when the whole world is saying that you're great because you did something that you knew was wrong, whose voice do you trust? The voice of God condemning that sin or the voice of the world praising you uh, for uh, doing something that pleased them? Now, that's why the faith, you know, trust is a kind of another word for faith, uh, to, to acknowledge God's authority, to fear him, to love him uh, as a response to the gospel, to, to be in that loving familial relationship with God your Father, and then also to trust that his promises are true, even when the world is making a very persuasive case sometimes uh, that those promises are false. So if we go through the catechism here, you know, question 24, what does it mean to have a God? It means to trust in and rely on something or someone wholeheartedly to help us in times of need and to give us all good things. And one of the things that we talked about, the main thing that you get is yourself, your identity. Why does God not want us to have any other gods besides him? Because there aren't any other gods. You don't have multiple creators. God is the only creator, therefore, the only voice that can determine uh, who you are, what you're worth, why you matter. And we look to the gospel then uh, to find that out. Uh, what does God require in the first commandment? Just what it says, that we fear, love, and trust in him above all things. Um, that's true of all people. That's question 27. Everybody needs to do that. Um, and then 28 and 29 and 30 talk about those words, fear, love, and trust, that we've just explained. Um, 31 does that um, uh, as well. If you look at question 32, it gets very interesting. What happens when we trust in other things rather than our Creator? Um, well, we end up breaking all of the commandments when we do that. Uh, what, are, what are some of these other things you know, that people might put their trust in? Well, people put their trust in their finances. They put their trust in their popularity. They put their trust in um, their looks. Their, you know, they put their trust in worldly things, pleasure. Uh, they say all of these things give their life meaning and value and make them somebody. Uh, and all of them will lead you astray. But really, you can't break any of the other commandments without breaking the first commandment because your actions are this matter of who are you trusting to get your identity? 
So you, you might remember from class, uh, some of you, uh, an example. Um, let's just say you know from studying, uh, say, the fourth commandment, uh, that you should respect the authorities in your life. So God says it's good if you respect the authorities and obey them, and it's bad if you're disrespectful or disobedient. But then you're a little kid and you go out at recess and you're on the playground and you get all of these kids around you saying, no, it's good if you're too cool for the rules uh, and you do something daring and, and against the rules and it's bad, it's goody two shoes, it's cowardly, it's um, babyish if you're too afraid to break that rule. Well, now you've got two contradictory voices. You've got the voice of God that you learned in class in the catechism, and you've got the voice of the world in the form of your, say, fourth grade friends or whatever age you are. Um, who are you going to listen to? Well, your actions will determine where you put your trust. You're either going to bow down to God as your God, or you're going to bow down to your peer group as your God. And that's having a false God. So breaking the fourth commandment by disobeying the rules is also breaking the first commandment because the reason you broke that rule is you said, this peer group gets to define me. This peer group is my God. Theirs is the voice that I listen to, that I put my trust in, that I fear. Uh, so whether you're breaking the fourth or the fifth or the eighth commandment, whatever it is, you do so because you're breaking the first commandment. And if you can keep the first commandment, the rest of them all flow. But if you break any of the commandments, it's because you've broken this first commandment. You should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And again, when we talk about law and gospel, we realize that the law is going to show you your sin. You've been there in the playground or not in the playground somewhere where you've broken the first commandment. There's no getting around it. So if it's just the law that you have, then you're doomed. It's over. But it's not just the law you have. You have God as your loving Father, and we're, as we go through the Creed and the Lord's Prayer and all of the different parts of the Catechism, you're going to see that you can fear, love, and trust in God above all things, especially when we talk about baptism, the God who claimed you in baptism. Uh, the Holy Spirit, when he gives you faith, he sets you free to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But that old Adam that sinful nature is going to constantly resist because of the allure of ambition and your own body and your peer group and the influential people in your life and just society in general. Those are all going to be the voices of false gods in your life. Um, so for today, what I want you to do is realize, okay, the first commandment, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And if I were to see you somewhere, and I know I'm not going to see any of you probably today because everybody's staying home, but I would say, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Uh, and the more you allow that to roll around in your mind, uh, and the more you're going through and you can see the Bible verses uh, that, that are talking about this, um, and it really goes... This goes all the way to, and we're going to come back to some of the things like, uh, you know, how do you know that there is a God, that kind of thing. Um, we're going to come back to that later. But this goes all the way through page 66 of your catechism. So just kind of look through that today, but mostly just be remembering uh, to know the commandment and the explanation. And we're going to, you know, the whole catechism, by the time confirmation rolls around, we're going to want people to really be able to know that uh, by heart. So... Uh, that's the first commandment, at least for now, and tomorrow we will take up the second commandment. Thanks.